Welcome to another episode of The Islamic Dilemma. I am your host, Al Fadi. In the uh, last episode, myself and my guest, uh, Bill Warner, we were discussing the implications of Sharia law on people of other faith. Uh, today, we will continue uh, along the same line, and we will show that Sharia law actually does not look favorably at anyone who does not believe in Islam, even if they were Christians or Jews. And also we are going to show some quotations from Islamic leaders uh, in regards to their view of Sharia law in relationship to the law of other lands. Bill, I'd like to welcome you again. Delighted to be here again. Um, Bill, there is something that I wanted to ask. Um, in your study about Sharia law and your research about Sharia law, did you ever come across something that is really surprising that you ask yourself, I cannot believe that Sharia law teaches about such a matter? The thing that leapt off the pages at me was basically on how to beat a wife. Now, now when, let me ask you this. We're talking about beating your wife. Beating your wife, so yes. Sharia law that you have investigated, you mm -hmm. studied, gives you detailed analysis of how to beat your wife. It's a whole procedure. This is not some drunken outrage of, of anger. The, there's levels and grades, and it's precisely dictated. Now, I had read Quran, Sirah, and Hadith before I read Sharia, but I guess some part of me thought, well, not all of this is going to make it to the law books, but quite to the contrary, it's amplified. It's laid out in very precise ways, the proper manner to beat your wife. It's almost a sacred text on this issue. Well, I, I, I want to point my viewers to this verse from the Quran. It is found in chapter 4, verse 34. We did discuss it before mm -hmm. when we dealt with the issue of the view of the Quran on women. And you can go to my uh, blog, the Islamic, uh, the Quran Dilemma.com, and also the book, The Quran Dilemma, and you can read even extensively about the treatment of women under uh, the teachings of the Quran. This verse is a very troubling verse, even to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, As those women on whose part you fear disloyalty, now it's talking to the husband and ill conduct. Notice the word is you fear. So there is some sort of a suspicion here. Mm -hmm. You don't have facts. You don't, don't have supporting it. evidence. You have your gut feel basically mm -hmm. that something might be uh, uh, going wrong. They might be doing something that is called an ill conduct. It says that if you have this fear as a husband, there is a step process. You can admonish them first then you can refuse to share a bed with them, and then you can beat them. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, the, and, the, and the Sharia text amplifies on it. Each of these is just a short phrase here, but in the Sharia text, they're amplified, and even suggested conversations are made as to how you will inform her about this. <laughs> now, uh, you know, and, and, and I would definitely uh, want to tell my audience that uh, at some point I am going to do uh, an entire episode that is dedicated uh, uh, for wife beating in mm -hmm. Islam. And we are going to systematically analyze all of the resources that teaches about this and also about the proper tools used yes. for this punishment and, and all the arguments and on both sides that are for or against. And in fact, uh, I want to point out another thing. If you are go to go and look at an English translation of the Quran of this verse, you'll be surprised to see that some of the translators took the liberty, and I say the liberty because it's not found in the Arabic text, and they added the word beat her lightly between two brackets. And I did ask a question before, why beat her at all? Well, uh, but of course, as you and I both know, the lightly has been added later by people who want to oil the waters and smooth things out. And that's what I call the sanitized version of Islam. Uh, that's the <laughs> yes. second Islam that you get normally in the West. Uh, because certainly if, if you were to look at a verse like this as a Westerner or a non-Muslim, uh, this has trouble written all over it. Well, not only is there trouble in the Quran verse, but as you've pointed out, there actually is an extensive doctrine 
this is one Quran verse, but when we go to the traditions of Muhammad, we go on and on in developing a complete doctrine of wife beating. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, Bill, I mean, just by looking at this verse, do we sense that there is any kind of an equality oh. between a male and a female? Well, if there were going to be equality, we would need another verse which states how the wife should beat the husband, but it's not there. But again, the issue of beating, to me, contradicts the concept well, of, of a peaceful religion. Oh, of course. I'm being ironic <laughs> when I say that, you know, there should be some husband beating verses. I mean, I'm married. I don't want my wife beating me. Now, um, when it comes to, for instance, since we're in a topic of Sharia law, when it comes to uh, the idea of having a male and a female witness in a court of law, uh, you know, what does Islam, for instance, say about that? In Surah 2, it lays out that a woman's testimony is only half that of a man. And it takes two women to equal the testimony of one man. And in fact, I would direct our audience right now to that particular verse that Bill just mentioned. It's found in chapter 2 or Surah 2 of the Quran, verse 282. It says this, And get two witnesses, not of your own men. And if there are not two men, then a man and two women. Notice a man and two women right. to substitute for two men. Exactly. A woman at that time wanted to question the Prophet of Islam about why two women and one man instead of just one man and one mm -hmm. woman. Do you know what the answer was, Bill? As I recall, it's, well, one of you will probably forget, and That's, the other one can remind her. That was one excuse, basically, because in the verse it does go on to say this. But the second troubling answer that he gave her, that don't you know that women are deficient in their in brain and in their intelligence? Yes. So, in other words, one woman will equal half one man. Mm -hmm. So that's why you, if you're a mathematician, you need two mm -hmm. halves to equal one, basically. Right. And uh, that's really not the better half uh, no. <laughs> in, uh, in my, in my no. view. No. No. Uh, this is basically Islam is looking at the woman as the worst half. Mm -hmm. So in the idea, basically, in, the, in terms of the legal testimony, women are not equal. Right. I want to show another passage that deals uh, with uh, the lack of equality between a male and a female. We find this in chapter 4, verse 11. It talks about the inheritance, for instance. Right. And this says that uh, Allah thus directs you as regards your children's inheritance to the male, a portion equal to that of two females. Once again, we have one man will get double the share of to, uh, of a woman, basically. So what, what we're saying here is the female, in other words, gets half the share of her brother. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to illustrate it in, in a better way. Let's say you have a father, and this father has one son and one daughter. The father dies, and he has a million dollar. The son gets 750, basically, mm -hmm. and the daughter gets 250, exactly. if I want to use just an illustration right. here, basically. Right. But there's something else interesting here. Step back further. A Muslim is told how to write his own will. This is how complete the Sharia is. It covers every aspect, not even a freedom to write your own will in your own way. So you cannot go and say, well, I want to write a will that I want to give all of my money to my daughter. No. You do, you do not have that choice. And that's one of the things when you study Sharia and, and you go on and on through it, it's the Sharia is like an iron suit that you ha everyone has to fit into. There's no choice. Well, obviously, uh, the Quran supports everything that we have just talked about. Um, what about other uh, areas in terms of the equality between a man and a woman? Uh, let's talk about marriage, for instance. Uh, can a woman under Sharia law, who is a Muslim woman, marry a non-Muslim man? No. No, no. Now, a Muslim male can marry a non, can marry a Christian or a Jew, but no, the woman is not, she's only to marry another Muslim. And of course, the idea is the man is superior over right. her. So notice how Islam looks at it. Islam 
looks at the even non-Muslim man to be superior over the Muslim woman. Yes. That by itself is another text proof that Islam does not provide any equality between a male and a female. No. So the other reason, of course, I, I want to add my insight here as a former Muslim, uh, there is a fear that because the man is the dominant over the woman, if he is a non-Muslim, then he will influence uh, the religion of his children from this Muslim woman. Right. In other words, the Muslim woman will have not, uh, will, won't have a say-so, mm -hmm. basically, over uh, the fact that her kids can follow Islam. The fear is that the main, uh, uh, the male who is the dominant mm -hmm. is going to draw his kids away from Islam. Now, by the way, if a Muslim male marries a Christian woman, is there any chance that the children will be raised as Christian? Absolutely not. not. Because, first of all, you inherit the religion and you only need the father to be a mm -hmm. Muslim. Then automatically, the fact that your father is a Muslim, the children now are considered to be followers of the religion of Islam. In case of a divorce, of course, the Sharia law court will look favorably into awarding custody of these children to the father simply because he is going to treat them in Islamic culture. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not going to uh, fear that the children will lose their religion or uh, be taught another religion. Right. Even if that means devastating the family, means separation between the children and their mother, uh, you know, other courts uh, that are uh, civic courts will always look for what is the best interest. What is in the best interest of the child? Uh, in Islam, what's in the best interest of the child is to become Muslim and stay exactly. in Islam and at the expense of separating families. Mm -hmm. All right, let me give you another example. There was a tsunami, and what was the uh, many Muslim parents were killed in the tsunami. There were some Americans who thought, well, we will adopt these children and raise them here in America. No. They could only be adopted if they were a Muslim family, not a Christian family. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's true. And um, what about the idea of divorce? Well, that's the man's prerogative. So only the man who is a Muslim can divorce his wife. The wife uh, uh, will, at least according to the pure Sharia law. A pure Sharia, it's, I don't think it's an option. I will concur with, uh, with that. Uh, you're not going to find anywhere that Islam gave the woman the freedom to even go and divorce herself. As I mentioned in a previous episode about mm -hmm. women and uh, their status in the Quran, that uh, a Sharia law judge will be faced with a dilemma if a woman will say, my husband is abusive, because if he wants to follow the law, uh, the Sharia law that is, uh, he's unable to divorce her. Mm -hmm. Only her husband has that power. Right. So... What about the idea of a woman who is divorced now and wants to come back to her husband? And let's say Sharia Allah says he must divorce her uh, no more than three times. Mm -hmm. If he divorces her three times, then she cannot go back to him. Is she allowed to go back to him after three times? Only if she marries another man first and they consummate the marriage. And that's what Sharia Allah basically teaches. Right. You marry a man, not just on paper. Right. We're talking about consummating the marriage. Exactly. We're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very vicious here in my illustration, sexual intercourse with a second man, and then divorce from the second man, and then after that divorce takes effect, then you can go back to your first husband. And by the way, when I read this, this was one of the, this is not a technical word, wackiest ideas I had ever heard of. This was really like, What? Marry another man, have sex, and now then you can remarry. That was so bizarre to me, and still is. <laughs> now, um, for the man, how, how easy is it to divorce uh, a wife? Is it uh, something that will take months and months of court proceedings? No. or As I recall, it's three times. And it, what is the word, talik? Yeah, talak meaning talak. Uh, you're released, basically. Right. Uh, now, uh, I want to mention to my viewers that in these days there has been fetwas issued that even you can email or, and yes. text your wife the divorce if you would just say it three times. Right. In fact, there has been a case in Pakistan that the husband supposedly while sleeping, he uttered the word divorce three times and the wife went to court to say, does that basically still apply even though he was speaking in his sleep? You know what the verdict was, Bill? Yes. It does apply. Doesn't that show that the male is dominant all the time, even in his sleep? Exactly. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but yes. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are approaching our uh, halftime break. Uh, when we come back, we will continue along the discussion of the implications of Sharia law. This time, we will focus our attention on the treatment of Christians and Jews. Pressure slowly building. An explosion that shocked the world. A coastline forever changed. The oil impossible to remove. Nothing could destroy it until the source was found, until that source was sealed. To uncover the source of Islamic terror, read the Quran Dilemma, Islam Unplugged. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the second half of our episode, The Islamic Dilemma. In the first half, uh, myself and my guest, Bill Warner, we were discussing the implications of Sharia law uh, as it relates to uh, women and as it relates to family law and other relationships. Uh, we are going to turn our attention in this second half on the treatment of people of other faith and in particular uh, people uh, who follow the Bible as the Christians and the Jews. Before I do that, uh, Bill, I still want to emphasize an important aspect of Sharia law that we have emphasized and uh, mentioned a couple of times already. Sharia law does not consider itself to be equal to any no. law or inferior to any law. It is basically superior to any law, including the law of the land. Correct. You know, the word Islam means some means submission really and what we see is that Sharia law is the perfect expression of this idea of submission our civilization is to submit in all of its customs and laws to that of Islam I want to direct uh, uh, my viewers to two quotations that uh, uh, they basically can go to the report I shared with them before Sharia uh, the threat to America, and they can uh, basically see that these quotations uh, were even listed in there. One quotation comes from the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. His name is Hassan al-Banna. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is what he says. It is the nature of Islam to dominate, and I want to underline the word dominate, not to be dominated. So the nature of Islam, the way Islam is, about the religion of Islam's intent is to dominate and not to be dominated. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say to impose its law, meaning the Islamic law, on, and I emphasize, all nations, not necessarily Islamic nations, to impose it. Notice there is a way of compelling others to accept the Islamic law. Let me ask you this question, Bill. If you want to impose your ideology on someone else, what are the means that you are going to use to get that across? Well, there's different means. You could try persuasion and right. even add a little deceit to it. Then you can have threats, demands, and then finally, as it matures, you can have violence. In fact, um, you know, some have even called the method that you've just mentioned as the first step as a stealth jihad. Precisely. In other words, you basically can try to go to a culture and to try to infiltrate this culture, build yourself, and begin to impose your thoughts and ideas and ideology slowly and gradually until you are in a powerful position. However, if you face with resistance the whole time or even at some point, you can revert back to the visible jihad if I want to call it that, mm -hmm. and that includes the idea of killing people. Suicide bombs is just an example of right. what goes on, or even uh, uh, military threats or attacks on civilians. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we want to take a look at the rest of his quotation. To extend its power to the entire planet. Notice, we're talking about the whole universe, the whole planet. We're not talking about expanding a territory of one country to take no. a territory of another country, which is still wrong. No, we're talking about imposing a law to all nations and extending its power. And that goes along with the idea of military power, physical jihad, mm -hmm. because um, 
peaceful means are not going to extend your ideology and your power. He didn't say our ideology. He said we want to extend our might, our power, a power basically, to the entire planet. Mm -hmm. Complete you know, hegemony. How do you feel about this bill? Does that give you a sense of peace? It gives me a sense of feeling threatened, particularly when I in America today, we see that Sharia is advancing in little steps here and there. Things are done because, well, that would offend Muslims, so we won't do that anymore. Or, well, yes, we'll tolerate, if they want to pray at school, we'll give them a special room. And each of these things seems small and unimportant. But looking at a long-range plan, I come back to the idea that this is the thin end of the longest wedge in the world. Which, and Of course, the other thing that's appalling is, is that people the non-Muslims don't want to look and see the true nature of Sharia. They want to deny that. Well, I'm hoping that whatever we have shared so far uh, will at least prompt them to uh, look into Sharia law and maybe even go and investigate our sources and investigate other sources and begin to develop a different opinion, a non-pacifist opinion. Mm -hmm. We're not asking, by the way, I want to emphasize, we're not telling people Muslims are bad people. What we're showing here that Muslims are the victim of these kind of laws and teachings that are imposed on them. If someone like Al-Banna is saying that the nature of Islam is to impose its law on other nations, imagine what would the, nation, uh, uh, the nature of Islam be uh, among its own followers. Obviously, it's a matter of imposing it on its own followers. So we want to emphasize that Muslims are the victim of these kind of ideologies. We're not asking you to hate the Muslim. We're asking you actually to continue to love the Muslims and, and care for them. But at the same time, there is a line that has to be drawn between respecting the law of the land and allowing other ideologies to be imposed on us. And in this case, an ideology that considers itself to be supreme. Mm -hmm. over all others. I want to share another quotation. This time the quotation came from uh, the uh, uh, foundation uh, called the Council on American Islamic Relations CARE. Uh, this was one of the co-founders and a board chairman back in the uh, year 1998. This quotation also can be found in the same report uh, that deals with Sharia. Again, the report is called Sharia, the Threat to America. It's report of Team B2. This is what the co-founder and the chairman at that time says. Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other face, uh, faith, but to become dominant. And I want to circle the word dominant. So Islam is not in another country, and this time it's America. That's where he resides, or at least that's where he made his statement. And it says that to be equal to any other faith but to become dominant. Then he goes on to say, the Quran should be the highest authority in America. To have the Quran become the highest authority, that means the Quran will trump the Constitution of the United exactly. States. Exactly. In other words, what the Quran teaches should be the law of the land in his mind, right. not what the Constitution of the United right. States teaches. And he's quoting pure doctrine. He is not making this up. These are the words of a good Muslim. He's giving us the Islamic truth. Absolutely. And he goes on to say, and Islam, the only accepted religion on earth. And this concurs with what we just shared in chapter 3, verse 85, that the only religion acceptable to God will be Islam, and all others are losers. Mm -hmm. So he is saying Americans are losers right. unless they follow the Quran and its teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the summary of these kind of statements. By the way, some people listening to this will go, oh, he's just an extremist. What we call in the media an extremist is someone who is simply adhering to Sharia law. This man is not making this up. This is not some creative idea. He is merely telling us what the doctrine really is. And, and to his defense, I want to say that he is sharing the truth about Islam. That's what I mean. He is not making up anything no. about Islam. No. And, and certainly, if anyone will to tell me right now that I've taken this statement out of its context, please tell me what is in here that indicates that it's taken out of its context. Indeed, it, 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 in context, it's a perfect fit with the entire body 
of Islamic doctrine. Absolutely. Well, Bill, let's talk now about the treatment of uh, Islam uh, uh, towards people of other faith. Uh, yeah. Other people of other faiths are called kafirs, right? Meaning, uh, people who are infidels. That's right. the Arabic word for infidels. Uh, people who associate other gods, for instance, with the God of Islam, or don't even worship at all. Mm -hmm. uh, should uh, an infidel uh, uh, be afraid under Sharia law? For many reasons. One of the things that is distressing when you look inside of a Sharia text is that you see Muhammad subjugated all of his neighbors, one after the other. And once he had subjugated Arabia, he moved north into Syria and Christian territory. So his entire life was spent attacking his neighbors and subjugating them. And that's what we see that is built into the Sharia law, this subjugation of both Christian and Jew. There's a word which we're going to come to called dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I. -M -M -I. And it means a Christian or a Jew who has agreed to be politically subjugated. And, and this is found in a Sharia text. Absolutely. And certainly the, uh, the discussion about the dhimmis will have to uh, basically take its own course in a separate show simply because we're approaching, uh, again, the end of uh, our episode. And I want to just uh, show a couple of uh, quick passages from the Quran. Uh, on the screen, you're going to see a verse from chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 51. It says this, O you who believe, talking to the Muslims, meaning, O you who Muslims, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. And the word friends, by the way, here in Arabic actually talks about taking them as supporters and protectors, mm -hmm. not just friends like relationship. We're talking about uh, uh, friends in terms of strength uh, uh, coming to support me, military support, mm -hmm. for instance, and things of that nature. For they are friends, but of each other's. Because the other word friends here talk about the relationship now between the Jews and the Christians. In other words, what this verse is saying that Christians and Jews are friends of each other against the number one enemy for them, which is Islam. I want to also show another verse. This one is found in chapter 9, verse 29, and we alluded to it already, yes. and we said that here is a command that if you are a Christian or a Jew, that the uh, Muslim must fight you. Fight those who believe not in God or Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that which is forbidden uh, by Islam and basically by Allah and His Apostle, and nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they be of the people of the book, Christians and Jews. So in other words, just for you becoming a Christian or being born a mere Christian or a Jew, uh, any uh, of these categories will basically allow a Muslim to fight you, yes. antagonize you, not treat you well. And the least we can come out of, from this verse is that you are inferior in status to the Muslim person, that he should not treat you fairly, that there is no freedom for you to choose what you need to mm -hmm. worship. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have been watching uh, our show on the topic of Sharia law. Uh, and you've watched our previous episodes as well on the same topic. Uh, my hope and my desire that we have shared with you enough information to help you discern for yourself that Sharia law is not a law that you would want to desire to exist in your community or in your state or in your country. Uh, as always, I encourage you to go to our website, send us your thoughts, uh, your questions, and your comments. Until we meet again in our next show, uh, I am your host, Al Fadi, and have yourself a mega blessing.